Ah, that is so good to hear your voices. I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church. We're so glad you chose to join us for worship, whether you're here in person or joining us online. I want to welcome you to our worship service today. Um, just a, a quick announcement. Um, we're going to have a prayer meeting tonight. Um, and this is in response to the turmoil and everything that's uh, going on in the world around us. You turn on the news right now and it is uh, abundantly clear that uh, we, we need to be a prayerful people. Um, and bring peace and search for the reign of the Prince of Peace. Uh, so tonight at 6 o'clock right here in our Family Life Center, uh, if you're able to come, we'd love to have you. We'll have it set up just like this, so we'll have our social distancing in place. Um, but we are going to gather together for an intentional time of prayer uh, starting tonight at 6 o'clock, and I want to encourage uh, everybody to come to that. Um, I want to uh, share a passage of Scripture with you today. Um, you know, I know it's not just me. I feel like it's all of us. If we turn on the news right now, we, we feel like uh, the world's falling apart around us. Uh, we see turmoil. We see uh, the opposite of peace that's happening in our lives. And, and, and I want to, I felt like I needed to address it. I felt like I needed to say something about it. And I've been prayerfully searching for the, for the words to share um, that I might make it better somehow or might be able to put a, a perspective on it. And the reality is, I don't have the answer to the woes of the world. What I do know is, is this. We're living in a time of conflict. Um, that there are people who are, 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 are breaking laws. There are people who are uh, looking for answers. And I think they're looking for the answers in the wrong places. Folks, folks, we're, we can't legislate our way out of the, the crisis that we're facing today. You know, we're, we're living in a world where police br brutality is a real issue that needs to be addressed. We're, we're living in a, in a world where peaceable assemblies are, are now being overtaken by riots. But I want to tell you something, guys. Police brutality is not the problem. Racism is not the problem. Rioting is not the problem. Those are symptoms of a greater problem. Those are symptoms of sin. We, we live in a world that is broken. And, and, and God knows this. There's nothing is surprising God right now. You know, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 tells us, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The, the situation that we're facing right now in the United States is not a surprise to God, and he's got an answer. His name is Jesus. It's in Jesus that all things hold together. So when we look at the news and it seems like our world is, is falling apart, I want us to be mindful of what God reveals to us in the book of Colossians chapter 1. In talking about Jesus, he says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And Jesus is before all things. And in Him, all things hold together. Folks, the reason things seem like they're falling apart is because the world desperately needs to know Jesus. What we're seeing in the world around us is a symptom of our depraved condition. We, we need a Savior, and praise be to God, He sent one. It says, in Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him... All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The answer is not in legislation. The answer is certainly not in Facebook posts. The answer is, is not in gossip in living room. The answer to the woes of this world are found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is himself the Prince of Peace. So that's our prayer, that the Prince of Peace would reign in this turbulent time. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the privilege that's ours to have the safety and the freedom to be able to assemble in this place and to sing your praises. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured, about, poured out upon us today. We pray you'd lead us, guide us. Lord, as a nation, we seek the reign of the Prince of Peace. Lord, open doors for us as your people to share the gospel, to tell a, of a love so great that you laid down your life not in spite of our sins, but because of it, paying the penalty for them, that we might be free of this chaos, that we might be free from violence, that we might be free from turmoil and find the peace that surpasses all understanding that's only found through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we offer this prayer today. Amen.
Folks, let's stand together this morning and let's worship together. I heard, I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is through me. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is through me. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. And he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is through him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. That's good news, church. Amen. Ashamed of what I've done, what I've become, these hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause. You plead my cause. You ride my road, you break my chains, you overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be, yeah, how can it be? I've 
have let you down inside I doubt that you could love me but in your eyes there's all grace now comes from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 through 2 it says therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant an offering and a sacrifice to God let's go to the Lord of prayer dear Heavenly Father we come to you this morning we just lift up our voices our nation is hurting, there's looting, there's rioting, and then there's you. You're in the midst of all this storm, and we know that there's one man that has calmed the storm, and that is you. Lord, we just ask that you calm this storm. You bring healing to our nation. But more important, let us learn to love as you have loved. Let us learn to forgive as you have forgiven, Lord. And let us all today, within our own homes and within ourselves, be imitators of you. We ask for all these things in your holy name. Amen. Stand if you're able. Let's continue to worship together. Amazing love. That welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. Sing, God, you're so good. Oh, God, you're so good. Oh God, you're 
so good, you're so good to me. Behold the cross, age to age, and hour by hour. Dead our race, the sinner say the work of your power. Thank God you're so good. Oh God, you're so good. Oh God, you're so good. Oh God, you're so good. You're so good to me. I am blessed. I am whole. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power. For the glory of Jesus' name. Sing, I am blessed. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. A highly favored, anointed, filled with your power. For the glory of Jesus' name. Should this life bring suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever. Oh, God, you're so good. Oh God, you're so good. Oh God, you're so good. You're so good to me. I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. I'm highly favored, anointed, and filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. Say, God, you're so good one more time this morning. Oh, God, you're so good. Oh, God, you're so good. You are, oh God, you're so good, you're so good to me. Sing it one more time. Oh God, you're so good. Oh God, you're so good. Oh God. You're so good, you're so good to me. And how great the chasm between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and then 
through the darkness your loving kindness it tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living Lord sing who could imagine church who could imagine so great a mercy what I could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stand down from glory In the cross, the cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my Lord. Hallelujah. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, and death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, and there's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. this grip on me you have broken every chain and there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me your very body began to breathe and out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Oh, Jesus, yours is the victory. on me you have broken every chain and there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah and death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain and there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living home jesus christ my living home oh god you are my living Oh, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in you, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. 
Father God, we come to you this morning. Thank you that you are our living hope. God, we praise you for who you are. We praise you for the love that you give us when we don't deserve it, Father. Lord, you have entrusted a beautiful gospel to broken people. So, Father, I pray that as we open your word today, purify our hearts, purify our minds. Lord, allow us to look more like you each and every day. Father, may we hide your word in our heart. Father, so those who we come into contact with may know that there is a Lord over our life who is greater than the things that we encounter on this earth. So, God, we remember you this morning, that despite anything that's going on in our world, we know that you are our hope. Father, the struggles that we have in our daily lives, the struggles that we have as a country and as a world, Father, can be solved when we turn to you. Father, we know that when that morning came, Lord, you came out of that grave, and Lord, you won the victory forever. And we look forward to that day when we stand on your, in your heaven, and as we look at your throne, and we finally lay eyes on you, Father, we look forward to that day where we can worship you forever, and we can see that the things that you have given us are true. So, Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for each and every one of us who have come here to worship and to sing and to open your word. Father, be with Pastor Mike as he divides your word this morning as he gives it to us. Father, thank you that you are not only the, the resurrection, but, Father, you are the giver of life. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. It's your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, that was some beautiful, joyful noise we made this morning. I want to invite you to go ahead and open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And I'm going to be finishing up this series of sermons I began seven weeks ago. Uh, the I Am Statements of Jesus. And today we're going to be talking about a statement where Jesus makes a bold claim. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And, and folks, as we look at this story, and it's a lengthy story, it's 44 verses long. Um, but as, as we look at this story, uh, I want us to come away with an idea. I want us to, to look at it through a, a, the lens of love, if you will. What's we're, what we're going to discover, the main idea behind this text today, is that Jesus' love for people is demonstrated in extraordinary ways. And when I say extraordinary, the, that word means unusual or remarkable. Um, you can even say unexpected. So as we look at the story of Jesus and Mary and Martha and Lazarus and, and we kind of try to figure out what that means for our lives today, what we're going to discover is that Jesus' love for you, his love for me, is demonstrated in unexpected ways. And now I know usually I'll have us stand together for the reading of the scripture that I'm going to be preaching on, and then I'll, I'll take time and, and, and work our way through it. I'm not going to do that today because it is 44 verses long, so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of preach through this entire text uh, just to keep your attention uh, focused where it needs to be. i got a limited window, so I'm going to try to honor that here. Um, but we're going to look at these verses today, but before I get into, uh, into the preaching portion of this worship service, I ask if you would, let's, let's pray together. Um, Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the gift of your word. And as we take time uh, as part of our, our worship and our adoration to you, uh, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to help us breathe in what you've breathed out. We ask for your Holy Spirit to, to unlock our understanding. Uh, Lord, as I stand here today before this assembly of believers, I ask that you give me the wisdom to rightly divide your word of truth and that the words I speak uh, may honor your truth. Uh, and Lord, help us uh, to find ways to live these truths out in our lives. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer today. Amen. Uh, you know, as we look at this story, it's a story that obviously ends in resurrection. It's a story that uh, I'm sure most, if not all of you, uh, are familiar with. But we do well to take our time, work our way through it, and, and figure out what God is trying to reveal to us through this text. So let's look at the very beginning of this, uh, John chapter 11, and, and let's look at just the first three verses. It says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. Bethany is the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love 
is ill. Now I want to stop right there and just make a, a couple of observations. We, we have two sisters and a brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who obviously have an, an existing relationship with Jesus. It's a relationship where Jesus loves them and, and they love Jesus as well. That's made clear from the text. If it's not, just look at verse 5. Verse 5 explicitly says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, so this is a love story, right? We get that from the, from the very beginning. And Lazarus fell ill. And we don't know what that illness was. We don't know exactly what was ailing him. What we do know was that he was knocking on death's door. It got so bad that Mary and Martha stayed by his side but sent word and said, Go find Jesus. So why would they do that? Well, well if we look at what Jesus had done up to this point, it would have been a perfectly logical and reasonable thing for them to do. Having witnessed all of his miracles, having heard of the testimony of Jesus and knowing what he's done, of course they wanted to send word to Jesus to come and heal somebody that they care about. They were doing what good Christians should do. They were interceding on behalf of their brother. They were reaching out to Jesus for healing. And I want you to ask yourself, what do you think they would have expected? What would Mary and Martha have expected in, in a response from Jesus? And if we look at, at John's account or we look at the Gospels, we can come away with a good idea of what they would have been seeking, what they would have been going after in, in sending after Jesus. They would have been uh, remembering the fact that Jesus, a complete stranger, walked up on people and called them to follow him. He said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And these men were instantly obedient and they followed him. They would remember that Jesus went to this wedding feast where instantly he turned water into wine for the celebration. Uh, they would have recalled the story where a 38-year-old invalid was healed instantly. All of these are found in the Gospel of John. They would have remembered that it was Jesus who with five loaves of bread and two fish fed 5,000 people miraculously and instantly. They would have known Jesus walked on water. They would have remembered that it was Jesus who was the only one who had the right to stone the woman caught in adultery, yet he showed grace and told her to go sin no more. They, they would have known the story of, of Jesus healing the man who was born blind, who was, ended up getting kicked out of, the, out of the temple. They would have known this Jesus, so they would have sent him. And they would have expected him to respond with healing. And I say that because there's a story that's remarkably similar Earlier in the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 46, look at this story. It says, So Jesus came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. Jesus had no relationship with this guy, right? Oh, there's a guy whose son was ill. And then when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, a complete stranger, he said, unless you see the signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to Jesus, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. So knowing all of this stuff, including this story, Mary and Martha, who were gravely concerned for their brother Lazarus, who was, who was at death's door, reached out to Jesus. It is logical to assume that they expected Jesus to provide healing at that moment, right? We, based on the testimony, based on the evidence, that would be the expectation but Jesus responds in an extraordinary way he, he responds in a way that is unusual that is remarkable that was unexpected look what happens in in verse 4 but we see the verse the, the word is but so we so we know something contrary to what is expected is about to happen but Jesus when he heard the news that Lazarus was was dying said this illness does not lead to death it is for the glory of God 
so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Kind of a weird response, isn't it? Based on everything we know about Jesus, somebody he loves is on death's door and, and, and good Christian folks doing what they're supposed to do, reach out to Jesus, and Jesus' response is not one of healing. Jesus' response is one that says, this illness is not unto death. This illness is for the glory of God and so that the Son of God may be glorified. It's likely that the messengers and the disciples all thought, well, you know what, the sickness must not be so bad. He's going to be okay. This, this illness is not unto death. Folks, Jesus chose to stay where he was for two more days, not to go see his friend whom he loved, not to go provide healing or not even provide healing like he did for the stranger early in the Gospel of John. But there's something important that we need to know. We need to understand that Jesus' reluctance to respond to the calling was not a measure of his love. Jesus very clearly, in God's word, loved everybody involved, yet he responded in a way that, that those he loved wouldn't have expected or even appreciated, if we're being honest. If they were asking for healing, asking for a miracle, and Jesus just says, hey, this isn't a big deal, and I'm going to stay here two more days. But his, his response, or lack of response, or whatever you want to call it, was not an indicator of his love, or a measure of his love. It was an extraordinary response. If we go down to, to, to verse 11 in this story, we see uh, another thing that's extraordinary about this story, and that is the inaction of Jesus. Look at this in verse 11 through 17. It says, After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. A little bit of insight to this. Jesus is telling them that Lazarus has passed away, but his disciples don't get it. They, they're thinking in their mind, well, Jesus just said this illness is not unto death. Now he's telling us that Lazarus has fallen asleep. So logically, they presume, okay, well, he's getting better then. Rest is good for those who are sick. He's resting. He, he's going to be better. In fact, that's exactly uh, what they say here. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to, the fel to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So think about this. Put this into perspective. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He told them this illness is, is not for death. It's for the glory of God. And so that the Son of God, so that Jesus could be glorified in it. So the disciples assumed that he was going to be getting better to where Jesus had to tell them, no, he died. And, and listen to this. This is... Can you imagine how hurtful, spiteful, or, or what your emotions would be if you heard this? Jesus said to him, or Jesus said, for your sake, in verse 15, I am glad I was not there. Jesus tells him, he says, I'm glad that I was not there at this time, and I'm glad so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twins and said, Let us go that we may die with him. And they came and they went and they found that, that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Now you can imagine what's coming next, right? Mary and Martha, who had sent word to Jesus to come and provide this healing, that healing never comes. And then they hear that Jesus is showing up, so there's a confrontation. They go out and they confront Jesus one at a time. The first encounter we see is in verses 18 through 27. This is Jesus and, and Martha. Let's look at verse 18. It says, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. This was a time of mourning. This was a funeral. This was a wake. This was a time where, of sadness and, and of mourning and of grieving the loss of, of someone that they loved. 
So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Mary left her brother's deathbed. She left the body when she heard that Jesus was going. She went out to meet Jesus. And in verse 21, it says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now look at this, he says, do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? In spite of the circumstances, in spite of the fact that, that I didn't answer you the way you wanted me to answer you, that I didn't answer you in the timing that you wanted me to answer you, do you believe that I am who I say I am? The Gospel of John is riddled with this question. Do you believe? It's a question that every single one of us has to ponder. Do we believe in the Word of God? Do we believe in the Son of God? And she says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Jesus tells her an unexplainable answer to a really profound question. When, when she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know how to paraphrase that? Where were you, God? Where were you? I called out to you. I reached out to you just like you said to do. I was faithful. I followed you. I reached out to you. Where were you? Because if you were here, my brother would not have died. It's profound to put ourselves in her shoes and, and to think about what, what she must have been going through. And folks, through it all, Jesus says, you know what? Your brother's going to rise again. Do you believe this? I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe that? In spite of all, everything that's going on, Jesus is still focused on that singular question. Do you believe? And it's a question that we've got to ponder today. In, in verse 28, we see a, another confrontation, this time between Mary and Jesus. It says, when, when Martha had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, teacher, the teacher is here and calling for you. And Mary heard it. She rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. They didn't hear the conversation where Martha came in and said, Mary, Jesus is here. All they saw was Mary leave her brother's deathbed and get up and leave abruptly. So like good friends would do, they followed after her uh, to console her. Verse 32 says, Now when Mary came to Jesus and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in all the Bible right there. Jesus wept. And folks, we, we've got to understand what's going on here. Mary had the same reaction that Martha did. If you were here, God, my brother would not have died. If you had only done this, my brother would not have died. She's asking, where were you? And look at Jesus' response here. It's interesting that Martha went out on her own to seek Jesus and her spiritual condition. It was Mary who, who stayed behind with her brother and only went when she was, when she was prompted. And, and Jesus has a different response to Mary. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. That phrase, deeply moved, in the English translation. How do we get there? The, the Greek word that's used there literally means to agitate or stir, as in water. In other words, an outside influence enters water and disturbs the water to make ripples, to make waves, right? Think of a spoon or a stirring stick. You stick it in water. An outside force has an effect on, on that water. And here, that's the word that the, the Greek translation uses to describe what Jesus was going through. He was agitated. 
he was moved, he was affected by the weeping, by the mourning of somebody he loved and the Jews. It had a profound effect on him to where he was troubled. He was affected by this. In this case, it was compassion or empathy for those who were mourning affected Jesus to the point where he wept. Here's another thing we need to learn, folks. Jesus' inaction, the fact that he didn't do what was asked of him, was not a measure of his love. As demonstrated here in Jesus' response, he felt for them. He felt for them as they were going through pain. He, He felt for them. He had great empathy for them, and it affected him and moved him so much that he wept alongside of them. Verses 36 and 37, I think the Jews give voice to what everybody was was probably thinking. Some of the Jews said, see how he loved him? They're looking at Jesus crying and saying, look at the compassion that this man has for, for these people. And in verse 37 it says, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? There was many people who were doubting who Jesus was. They were doubting his abilities. They were doubting his love. They were doubting everything. And then Jesus turns it all around. Look at verse 38. Then Jesus deeply moved again, stirred again. His emotions were stirred to be with these people. It says he came to the tomb and it was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. This body had been dead four days, so decomposition had started. There was already uh, an odor of, of, of rotting flesh. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Jesus is, is calling her to faith again. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Can you imagine this scene? A body dead and buried for four days. And Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Why did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? Why did he do it? He was demonstrating the fact that he is the resurrection and the life. And folks, without a doubt, that is the focal point of this story. The cumulative event of this story is Jesus demonstrating his power to give life to that which had died. Resurrection is not a a new creation. Resurrection is raising life from something that has, has died. And while that may be the focal point of this story, I submit to you the same thing I submitted to you at the beginning. This is a love story. And what we see clearly throughout this story is that Jesus' love for people is demonstrated in extraordinary ways, unusual, remarkable ways, and the same is true in our lives today. He demonstrates his love for us in remarkable ways. There's three things I want us to learn from this story. The first one is this. Jesus' love for you is not measured by his response to your circumstances. Jesus' love for you cannot be measured in the earthly terms of his response to your circumstances. We are called to trust in his timing. We are called to trust that God is so good, you're so good, you're so good to me, just like we just sang a few minutes ago. We're called to trust in his timing. When Mary and Martha sent for Jesus, they did so with expectations that that Jesus would hear them and that Jesus would provide healing but he did not. Yet the Bible, God's word, is perfectly clear. Jesus loved them. Even though he didn't respond in the timing that they want to. Mary and Martha's pleas were heard by Jesus. And Jesus answered, but not in a way we would have expected. He says, all the way back in verse 2, It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But then when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified in it. 
We've got to remember the order of the words. Jesus' untimeliness, if you will, was not an indicator of his love. God's word goes to plainly say, do not understand Jesus' non-response to their request as a measuring stick for his love. Verse 5 tells us he loved them in spite of the answer, in spite of the evidence that they may have been experiencing. So folks, if or when Jesus doesn't answer your prayers in a way that you would consider timely, do not assume that it's because Jesus doesn't love you. It's so easy to come to that conclusion and say, well, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've asked for this and it's, and it's not happened, so Jesus must not love me. Do not draw that conclusion because it couldn't be further from the truth. We need to trust in God's timing because he sees the big picture that we can't see. I love what the prophet Isaiah writes in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Jesus sees things from a different perspective than you and I do. That's why we're called in, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding of things. We have to trust in his timing. Jesus' love for you is not measured by his response or his lack of response to your current circumstances. You're called to trust him, to trust in his timing. Second thing we need to learn today is this. Jesus' love for you is not measured by his action or inaction in your life. We need to trust in the presence of God. Both Mary and Martha said the same thing to Jesus. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. They were asking a simple question that I'm sure if we're being honest, we have all asked at some point. Where were you, God? Where were you when I called for you? Where were you? when this tragedy struck in my life. Some of us may be wondering that same thing today. Where are you, God, with all these riots going on? Where are you, God, when people in position of authority are abusing that authority, using force not necessary? Where are you, God, in our nation today? I submit to you we need to be mindful of what we read here in verses 32 and 33 of John chapter 11. When Mary came to Jesus and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Folks, no matter what you're going through, do not think God has abandoned you. His word promises he will never leave you nor forsake you. That even though things aren't going the way you want them to go, he is always there. Jesus did not heal Lazarus in this story. But that in no way, shape, or form was an indicator of his love for Mary, Martha, or Lazarus. And if Jesus is not doing what you've pleaded with him to do in your life, do not jump to the conclusion that he's not answering your prayer and doing what you've called him to do because he doesn't love you. Because that couldn't be further from the truth as well. We need to learn to trust in his goodness and we need to learn to trust in his presence. That's why the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I'm with you always. Always. There's never a time where Jesus is not with us. Even to the end of the age, he says. We can remember what I just read from Isaiah 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Folks, Jesus' love for you is not and cannot be measured by his action or inaction in your life. We need to learn to trust in his presence, that he's always there with us. The last thing I, I want us to focus on today, the last point. We've already talked about how, how we don't measure Jesus' love. Here's how we measure it. Jesus' love for you is measured by his death and resurrection. We need to trust him as our Lord and Savior. The focal point of this story is what? It's the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, right? That's the focal point. That's the big event in, in this story. 
It proves that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But it not only proved his power, it also proved what was in doubt in the minds of everybody involved. It proved the love of Jesus. Because make no mistake about it, if we walk a mile in the shoes of the people who went this story, it went through this story, Jesus' love was in doubt when he didn't respond to Mary and Martha's plea to heal their brother. They had to have doubted his love for them at that moment. Jesus' love would have been in doubt when he didn't take action to go see Lazarus. He decided to stay where he was for two more days. But when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he erased any doubt about his affection and love for him. When Jesus gloriously raised Lazarus from the dead, it was proof positive that all along, through every step of this story and every step of every person's life in here, God loves you and he's got a plan for you. His love is demonstrated even when they couldn't see it. Which is why I say the point of this story is that the love of God is demonstrated in extraordinary ways. Unusual ways, but God is clearly crying out to each and every one of us, I love you. And we need to wrap our brains around that message. In fact, God so loved the world, as John 3.16 tells us, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will never perish, but will have everlasting life. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this, But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrates his love. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 say this, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Folks, know this. The love of God is not demonstrated by him doing what you ask him to do when you ask him to do it. The love of God is demonstrated in the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. The most extraordinary act of love you and I will ever experience is the moment that Jesus at the direction and will of his father voluntarily surrendered his life on a cross in your place so that you don't have to experience death that by believing in the resurrection believing that Jesus is the resurrection and the life that you can have life everlasting in his name it's glorious and until we embrace that good news of the gospel, until we embrace the good news that God loves us so much that he spared us from death, then we're always going to wonder, does God love me? We're always going to wonder, where are you? Folks, you know where he is? He's at the right hand of the throne of God right now, calling you to be with him through faith, through trust, trusting in his timing, trusting in his presence, trusting in his goodness, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it hurts when we grieve, when we mourn, when we turn on the television and watch our brothers and sisters rioting in the streets. God is there in the midst of all of this, and he's calling us to believe in him. I want to close with an invitation today. And an invitation that we find in today's text, verses 25 and 26. Martha is lamenting the death of her brother Lazarus. Even though she had cried out to Jesus for healing, even though he didn't answer her the way he wanted her to answer, or she wanted him to answer, even though he didn't respond in the time that she wanted Jesus to respond in, Jesus says these words, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Church, I want to ask you that question today. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? In just a moment, we're going to sing and have a, have a time of response. And I don't want anybody to come forward. I don't want anything like that. I want you to just stay where you're at and meditate on that invitation from Jesus. It's not my words, it's his. Do you believe this? Do you believe that he is good? Do you believe what we just sang a few minutes ago when we opened this service? God, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good to me. Even though we may not 
experience his presence in the way we want to. Even though we may not experience uh, the riches of his miracles at our beck and call, we've got to trust that God is still good, that he's got a plan, that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So folks, as we have a time to respond, would you, su would you submit yourselves to that truth today? And say, God, you're so good. Help me to trust you. Help me to love you. Help me to embrace the fact that I am lovable, even though I don't feel like I'm being loved right now. I trust that you love me. And would you say this back to him, church? Say, I love you too. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father in heaven, as we come before you today, we're reminded of the glorious but simple truth that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what's going on in our lives, we can lay claim to the eternal promise that you are good and that you love us. And help us to love you too. Open our eyes. Open our hearts to accept that you love us even when we're not lovable. That you love us in spite of the fact that we're not lovable. That you love us so much. And you desire a relationship with us so much that you subjected yourself to the horrors of the cross. To experience death in our place so that we don't have to. God, as we come before you today and, and respond to the truth of your word, I pray for your Holy Spirit. To speak to all of us. May we embrace the greatness of your love today. And may we live it out each and every moment of each and every day. God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to worship one more time with us this morning. Savior say my strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And Lord, now indeed I find and I have and not alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone cause Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it right as died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow ask if you would to be seated for just a moment um, except for Ms. Stan and Miss Tammy uh, come on up here if you would please folks um, y'all know brother Stan and, and Miss Tammy they've been part of our church for a, a very long time long before I got here even um, and, and God has been working on their hearts and they want to move their letter of membership here to First Baptist Church uh, so I present I guess I don't even have to present it there's your response right there uh, 
excited to see in even more ways how God is going to continue to use you guys. So thankful for, for this decision and for you joining this fellowship of believers. Now, we can't hug on necks. We all know that. Um, but we do want to congratulate you. We do want to welcome you into, into, into this fellowship. And I'm sure folks are going to want to talk to you as they leave and just say congratulations. But uh, we're so excited and thankful that, that God has, has led you to this decision. Um, as we go today, uh, folks, I'm going to ask if you would stay where you're at. One of our deacons will come get you, um, and we'll make sure we got our, our distance as we, we exit this uh, place of worship today. Again, thank you for being here. We will have a prayer meeting tonight. I encourage you all to come out 6 o'clock tonight and join us for a time of prayer for healing. But as we go, let's go with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the gift of this day. Thank you. Uh, that you're a God who, who's still showing that you love us, still working in our lives. We especially rejoice in the Bud family today as they uh, uh, take steps to officially get plugged in here and, and to continue to do your work in gospel ministry uh, through First Baptist Church. Um, God, as we depart from this place today, help us to be mindful of the truth that no matter what we face in this life, uh, that you love us, that you're with us, that you never leave nor forsake us. And may the things we say and do reflect your glory and goodness so that everybody we encounter might see you in us. We love you and all God's people said, amen.